Hi, everyone, and welcome to the show. Today, I have a special guest, Jillian Murphy. Dr. Jillian Murphy is a registered licensed doctor of naturopathic medicine, having completed the Canadian College of Naturopathic Medicine's four-year postgrad program in 2006. She had, prior to that, graduated from, from the University of New Brunswick with a bachelor's degree in science and kinesiology. And she works with people, uh, she works with people on the psychology of eating, the relationship between weight and health, intuitive eating, and how to get out of the diet cycle. All topics we love. So welcome to the show, Jillian. Thanks for having me. I'm excited to be here. Yeah. So how did you get into this work? Can you say a little bit about what attracted you to doing this? Yeah, sure. So I think like most people, it was personal and professional. Um, mm -hmm. In my early 20s, I suffered from uh, an eating disorder that we now know as orthorexia, but wasn't recognized at the time. So a lot of anxiety and fear around how clean my food was. This was when I was just getting in. I always thought I would go into medicine. I got interested in naturopathic medicine. And as part of that, started going down that rabbit hole of like food in the body. And, and um, for me, it went really far and it became sort of a, an obsessive sort of anxiety disorder. And so it was a really interesting thing to work myself out of that while also studying naturopathic medicine and studying food and the effects of food on the body. And I think I did a fairly good job of working my way out of it. Cause like I said, it wasn't well recognized at the time. Mm -hmm. um, but for me, the even deeper work happened after I had my second baby and weight didn't come off the way it had with the first baby or the way that I had been told. And it really shed light on some of the ongoing misunderstandings that I had about body and weight and food and movement and health. Yeah. Let's talk about some of those misunderstandings. What are some of the things, things you learned from your personal experience, but also that you're seeing with your own clients? That right. Well, yeah. well, at that time, yeah, at that time, I think I had thought that I'd worked myself, you know, out of this like food issue, but the underlying continued misunderstanding that my weight was a direct reflection of my health and that any change in my weight was a representation that there was something wrong with my health. And so as I tried to get the weight off after that body, I started to notice myself going down those not so healthy holes again that I had done in my early twenties. And I, you know, worked with someone and I did a lot of research. And this was when I really found health at every size and began to understand that like, oh my gosh, health and weight are not synonymous. And actually sometimes when we are in the pursuit of weight loss, we do things that are not very healthy for us, well, which is what of, I was doing. But lots, lots of times, times really. <laughs> lots <laughs> of times, exactly. Lots of yeah. times. And, so. and for me, it was just a big awakening in terms of the patients that I was working with, because even though I was attempting to not sell weight loss in my practice, it was inherently baked in to the health message. And so I had to do some really big untangling in my work and really shift my message. And, and I, I think a lot of healthcare practitioners have had to go through that. And I like the way you say it, untangling because health and weight are so entangled uh, yes. in medicine yeah. in general, that it's very difficult to have a conversation or to even talk about health without people wanting to lose weight. And I, I know that uh, there's a term now that's called healthism, which uh, is pointing to what you're talking about, which is yes. just that people are saying, oh, no, I don't want to lose weight just because I, I want to look good. I want to lose weight for my health. And that's the new way of saying, you know, I want to go on a diet, essentially. Yeah. And as a naturopath, that is very much the um, population that I end up working with. And so that's a huge part of my work is that untangling process, because there are individuals who do want to be healthy. Um, and they can't understand, I know all the right things to do. I know all the things I should be doing. Why am I not doing them? And so a big part of my work is pulling these things apart and understanding what behaviors they're engaged in that actually are helpful and what are about control really. Yeah. And it could be about weight or it could be about that 
virtue signaling with food that that is often happening in the health and wellness world right now, right? Well, say what the virtue signaling means. I haven't heard that term before. Well, it's it's um it comes from Ellen Satter's work actually, and it's oh. this um moral high grounding basically and like I eat a certain way therefore I'm a better person and this becomes additionally problematic because it's really hard to give up on certain ways of eating even when it's not working for you if Mm -hmm. you think that your goodness as a human being your intelligence your um virtue um, yeah is is tangled up in the food that you eat it becomes and, and really that tricky. Goes, actually that goes back centuries and it it also dovetails with uh, a, a lot of what we're learning now about how bmi came about and uh and how racist bmi is and absolutely and this, and this whole thing i think was iterated in stringer's book where she talks about how this what you call virtue signaling uh, positioned white women as virtuous if they are thin, uh, Christian, moral, etc. But thinness was a, a big part of being able to even say you were a good Christian. So if you're not thin, you you don't love God enough, or you're not you know praying hard enough, or something like that. And then on the other juxtaposed against that was black women who were seen as not as virtuous because of their larger size or different body shape. And, uh, and it's continued to this day. So it's amazing. Right. right. Like it must be their fault because of their inferiority as a human being. And it, and it paved the way for all kinds of dehumanizing belief systems and practices that are just illogical and they're, they're not scientific and they're not true and they don't make sense. But yeah, it was very much about separating European women, white women from immigrants and and women of different color and then yeah Sylvester Graham you know if we go all the way back to that Graham cracker which was actually a really awful diety bland cracker that he used to sell you know he used to sell as part of his restrictive diet plan to control sexuality and to control virtuousness but yeah well but then there are some mores yeah yeah that made made the the Graham cracker (laughs) A lot more (laughs) sinful, right? (laughs) Yeah. And it became a more delicious thing over time. You know, it was really this very bland, but yeah, you're totally right. Like the, the roots of this, we can say it's for health, but you're right. It's, it was ableist. It was classist. It was racist. It was like so many of the isms are baked into the current health and wellness system. And I, you know, I think the thing that always amazes me is, you know, a lot of people, um, during, especially in the United States, I don't know how the protests have played out in Canada, but in the United States, you know, there has been a lot of um, pushback from white women who, you know, many of whom identify as conservative women and so on against the, um, the protests. And I think it's the same kind of mentality that was set up by these, you know, strategies to which held went white women down as much as they held black women down. Do you know what I'm saying? Yeah, so, are you talking about the Black Lives Matter um, protests? Yeah, the black lives yeah, matter. yeah, and that yeah. idea of like, um, like being against the violence of the protest while not acknowledging right. the centuries of violence that's been imposed on bodies, and that there's a real difference in, you know acting out and pushing back against systems of oppression that literally are dehumanizing versus breaking a window of a store. Like these are different things and right. equating them is wrong, it's but wrong. making them the same thing is wrong. Right. Exactly. Yeah. But I think uh, I'm, I want, I'm not saying it uh, as well as I should be able to say it, but the other part of it is this notion that uh, this like Black Lives Matter is a black struggle, so it doesn't have anything to do with people, you know, white folks or white women. But the same oppression that happens with black people also happens in some degree, not not exactly the same degree, but uh, the degree uh, against white women and and this struggle to be always be thin and be virtuous is a perfect example of that because it has led to white women developing you know hundreds of years of eating disorder behavior and body hatred Mm. yeah Sonia Renee yeah Sonia Renee Taylor talks about this and it's like I think I think what you're saying I think I'm getting is like 
there, there's this idea that there are systems of structure and structures of power in place that rank human bodies yeah. and it ranks human bodies based on race, but also ability and thinness and many other things. And, and gender and sexuality is also one of those things. And that, you know, I think, I think Sonia Renee Taylor talks about the fact that yeah, it's, and I talk about it in my work often, this idea of like, it's difficult to unhook from those systems of power when you have the illusion of benefiting from it in some way. Yeah, right. And so it's like, I have this access as a white woman, if I can keep myself thin enough, I have access to these terrible it's dregs of power, power right? Yes. Like I, I the have dregs, a bit of access. Exactly, yeah. the dregs. It's like uh, this yeah. pitiful, but I'll take it. If I can just hang on to this and maintain my stature in the system, I'll take it because it's all I've been told I can get. And mm-hmm. yet really, and Naomi Wolf writes about this as well. We really benefit when we unhook from the system and we unhook from the ranking of human bodies. Mm-hmm. That's when we really win. When you're within it, you're always at the mercy of, mercy it. of it. Yes, exactly. Yeah. And you know, that I think the um, way to control women has always been about controlling women's bodies. You know, the abortion struggle is an example of that. Uh, we have a challenge now in the United States to Roe v. Wade, but being thin, I think, is the primo way that women of all sizes, shapes, and colors have been controlled by quote unquote, the system, which is, yeah, predominant. it's about obedience, right? It's how yeah. obedient are you? How good are, like, again, it plays into that whole, how, virtuous how good are you? How smart yeah. are you? How much willpower do you have? And it's, um, yeah, it's just such and, a harmful storyline. You know, there's slut shaming against women who express their sexuality. There's also other ways that the virtue of women ha- has been challenged throughout the centuries. But I think weight is one of the biggest political ways women are kept under control and one of the I mean not that these other ways have totally dissolved because they absolutely haven't but it's one of the most um it remains one of the most socially acceptable ways to Mm -hmm. control right like it's it's still thought of by large groups of people as and and professionals as resolutely helpful to continue to be controlled by weight and food and so there's just and that's one of the reasons why I got into the work that I do and became a, a non diet practitioner, because I have worked with literally thousands of women over the 30 plus years I've been in medicine, who have spent so much money, so much of their time, so much of their energy, who have limited themselves uh, from reaching out for a bigger career or for a relationship or you know, fill in the blank uh, because, because they were waiting to get then and they didn't feel that they could have what the life they really wanted unless they were thin. And, that it, and that's, you know, it's unbelievable that intelligent, bright, you know, heartfelt women with so much to offer would be putting so much of, we would be putting so much of our time and energy into obsessing literally about food and, and weight. Yeah. One of the reasons that I put, you know, in my bio, I talk about a little bit about, you know, I work with smart, diverse women, you know, it's to highlight the fact that a lot of the women that I work with are incredibly intelligent and effective Mm -hmm. and successful. Mm -hmm. And so this becomes the one thing that they don't understand why they're failing at it, because that's the trick of diet culture, right? 90% of people fail at it, but it makes every person feel like they are individually failing. And because of the virtuousness that we've been talking about, there's so much shame involved that nobody wants to take a look at it. Right. And so I always say like, there was no box on the multiple choice test that said, I could just choose. Maybe my body is fine after Mm -hmm. I had a baby and with some weight stayed on, Like there was no there was no vocabulary for that. There was no option. And there, and there are no movie stars who, who are coming in the media and saying, yeah, I have stretch marks. I'm okay with that. Or yeah, yeah my, my, my belly is, is a little saggy and it's okay. Or Instead, I have a yeah. belly, you know, like it's always yeah, or I have framed a belly. as a problem. It's <laughs> always framed as a problem. And yet, you know, I, like, it's what, one of the processes of my, my personal work has been to accept that I'm, I'm a bit of an apple shape and I, 
exercise every day and I eat well and I take care of myself. And occasionally someone stops me to say, when are you due? You know, and it used to be something that would kill me. But through the work, I realized that's their misconception. They have, they have been brainwashed to believe that anytime a woman has a belly, despite the fact that we're surrounded by women with bellies, I know they're either pregnant or there's a problem. Yeah, And I understand that for some people they're pregnant and for some people there could be a problem, but it's not the truth of, you know, it's not the fact that, that it's, and it's so- not who you are either. It's, right. Right. It shouldn't, it shouldn't define who you are, whether or not you have a belly. Let's look at uh, the male population. How many men have, bellies? I always say Alec Baldwin's allowed to have a belly. Yes. <laughs> yeah, that's a good example. And, <laughs> and, and, and like, so I just, you know, now through pulling apart the shame, I'm no longer embarrassed. I just sort of say, you know, if somebody says it to me, I say, nope, that's just my body. I have a belly. A lot of women have bellies yeah. and we just move on. And, um, and but it's, yeah, it's men are allowed. Good. And I, what, what I don't think a lot of women realize is that first of all, the diet industry would collapse if women just stood up and said, no. I'm done with dieting. If, if, you know, women across the globe just said, you know what, I'm done. And that would collapse because it's built on the model that women have to fail in order for the diet industry to make money. And most of my clients never have, they've never thought about that. Like Mm -hmm. $65 billion in the United States. That's how big the diet industry is. Yeah. And so yeah. I think it's it's important to bring these subjects up, but I think it's also on the flip side important to address people's yearning for this dream of being accepted. Because really, to be thin, like we talked about earlier, is really a, a desire to be accepted, to be uh, valued in society. And that is the measure that has been set for women. So we can't blame ourselves for, you know, wanting that. Um, yeah, you're talking about like, uh, I call like, yeah, it's this, it's this added layer, especially for women who are working very hard to be, you know, feminists and like aware. And it becomes this really challenging thing because it's like, I know I shouldn't care about this but I do. So now I have the pain of caring about it and not measuring up to the cultural ideal. And then the added pain layered on top of me, the pressure, the responsibility of somehow being above it. And yeah, and that's right. Cause health at every size can be a pressure too, for women. Like, absolutely. like you said, I shouldn't be feeling bad about how I look and yet I do. And that's why I frame it as a dream. It's maybe a dream that started in childhood, even where, you know, little girls who were, you know, a little bigger than their peers were teased and bullied. And then it carries on into adulthood. And so we need to help women, I think, reframe that dream rather than, um, you know, saying there's something wrong with you because you keep wanting to lose weight. Yeah, really validate. I I spent a lot of time validating the reality that there is social privilege that comes with having that cultural ideal body. And it and it is a social privilege because it is inherently unavailable to most, right? Mm -hmm. Like the the you know, Rubenesque, the sort of like Botticelli body stopped being in vogue the moment it became all too common to be able to achieve it, right? And so the body ideal is, is evolved, has evolved and will constantly evolve to be something that is challenging to get. And that's why it holds social privilege, right? And so it is a real thing to want to have that body because there's social privilege. But at what point, you know, the work I do is like, at what point are you sacrificing so much of your life? Like what is the cost? The at cost. What point is the cost? become right. greater than the reward. Right. And, and I think and, that's where a lot of women are, but it takes them decades to get there. Sure. Yeah. Where they have, you know, been on 50 different diets and finally they wake up one morning and say, you know, this, I just can't do this anymore. Or I see that there's something more behind it. Um, and, and that's when the, the real change happens is when yeah. you get to that point. And I just wish it could be a little bit sooner than what it is but 
Mm-hmm. I think we just have to keep having the conversations because like I said, there's just so little vocabulary for most women. You know, sometimes um, a criticism that I will get in my work is, can't you just support all women? And if women want to lose weight, can't you just support those women too? And I will say, yeah, I can. Mm-hmm. If those women understand that there is an option to not be on that diet roller coaster for the rest of their life, if they really understand that their health and their well being and their access to joy and success and fun and all of these things is possible without being on that roller coaster, and they still choose the roller coaster and they understand all of the consequences of that roller coaster and they still make a choice, sure. But I think that most women don't have the vocabulary and they don't understand and, and that there may, are choices. It may be, it also may be too much to ask of some. Yeah. Women. Yeah, um, I, I can think of a couple of my clients who've been through the anchor program, which is my online program for right. eating disorder. And, um, and, you know, one of them had been in the program for uh, probably a year and a half, and just was still really struggling with uh, her behaviors, you know, binging and, and uh, just snacking all day and all of those things. And mostly was struggling with uh, dealing with her trauma. And because when we talk about behaviors, for me, that's just really a smokescreen for what's going on in the background. And, you know, trauma takes time and effort to, uh, you know, to, to heal. And so she was struggling with dealing with the trauma that she had been through. And, you know, at many points, people the trauma can take so long that people just want to give up and say, well, if I just lose weight, I don't have to deal with the trauma. So she got to the point where her doctors had, you know, multiple doctors that she was seeing told her, you have to lose weight for your health. And she and I had many conversations, which she was very, you know, open about and listened and went back and forth. But at the end of the day, she decided to have bariatric surgery. So I didn't throw her out and say, no way. Yeah. I didn't say you're wrong. You're a bad person. You, you know, you're giving in to the diet culture, all of those things. No, I said, I support whatever you decide. And, you know, I'm basically, I'm here for you. Yeah. And, and so many, so I think, however, there is a segment of people who, who work in this field who are, you know, much more militant about kind of demanding that women understand this and realize they can be healthy no matter what their size. I feel like women should make their own choices. That's the whole point. Yeah. I'm all about the, like I'm human centered. Right. And I understand part of my work is like really, really, really exploring the complexities of like, like food isn't just fuel. It's complex. It's biopsychosocial. And so is our relationship to body and the world. And depending on childhood experiences, Mm -hmm. depending on layers of marginalization and oppression. There's lots of reasons why people might choose. Again, for me, it, which sounds very similar to your approach, it's about presenting all of the options, mm-hmm. understanding the consequences. And then if you have to go down that route for whatever reason, how do I support you? We all know, anyone who works in this field, that bariatric surgery may result in some weight loss. It doesn't result in a better relationship with body or food. So that work still needs to happen, yeah. right? Yeah. Um, and, and yeah, I, I am, I'm totally in agreement. Like, I think that the choices that people make are complex. It's all about presenting the options, understanding the benefits, the consequences, the results, and then how do we help support people to do as well as they can in their bodies? Yeah. And to gain freedom from yeah. their and yeah. their body hatred. Well, Jillian Murphy, it's been a pleasure to talk to you, and I'm really glad to have had you on the show. And maybe we we can get you to come back again and talk some more about these issues. Yeah, I could talk for hours anytime. (laughs) (laughs) Okay, Uh, I will talk to you soon. Bye.